Now, what we, what we have here in, in the first chapter of Hosea is kind of an, an overview of the entire book. What you have is kind of a summary. It's, it's a bird's eye view that gives you kind of some concept, some understanding, some framework to understand everything that is going to follow. And as you can read in the first chapter, Hosea is kind of a, it's an intriguing story. And there are some intriguing characters. You have Hosea, and you have Gomer. You have a prostitute, and you have a prophet. It's, it's unusual, to say the least. Complicated. Maybe you're sitting here this morning, and you're wondering, what exactly does this book have to say to me? And maybe you're wondering, you're looking at this book and you're saying, well, how in the world is this going to have relevance for our life and for our time and for our day? And I want to say that this book actually has incredible relevance for our day. An incredible relevance for our time and an incredible relevance for the church today. But to understand that, in order to to kind of comprehend the, the relevance for our day, you need to understand something of the background behind the story of Hosea. And so that's where I want to start. We read that the word of the Lord came to Hosea, son of Beeri, during the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and during the reign of Jeroboam, son of Jehoash, king of Israel. Now, based on these names, these list of kings, most commentators agree that Hosea's prophecy spanned a a period of about 40 years. So he prophesied from about 755 before Christ to about 715 before Christ. And I want to share with you um, a map to, to kind of give you some sense of the political landscape at the time, just to understand the, the scene that Hosea is living in. Now you can tell from, from the map that there is, uh, for the people of God, there is a divided kingdom. And what I mean by that is that the people of God are divided into two halves. You have Israel to the north, which which is composed of ten tribes. You have Judah to the south, which is composed of two tribes. Now Hosea's prophecy and the words that he has to say, they are largely against the northern kingdom of Israel, which he sometimes refers to as Ephraim throughout the book. And and he has a word for them that says, you are on track for disaster. He says, things are not going to go well for you. But for the people of Israel, this would have been incredibly hard to believe. When Hosea came with these words, he was the kind of guy that they were going to laugh out of town because, because they were living in a time of immense prosperity. Israel was experiencing a time of tremendous wealth. You can read in in 2 Kings 14 about how God takes the king and God allows Jeroboam II, God allows him to restore the boundaries of Israel. And so you could see that actually on that map, if you look at the, the green striped areas, this is all land that is reclaimed under the rule of Jeroboam II. There are tremendous gains. So Hosea comes this word, he says, hey, you're headed for destruction, things are not looking good, and they are looking around themselves and saying, we have huge wealth. Our land has expanded. There's tremendous prosperity. Things are going really, really, really well. I mean, really well. The people have not experienced a time this good since the reign of Solomon. Things couldn't be better. But there was one problem, and that problem was that they had forgotten God. Things had become so, so good, they didn't really need to depend on God anymore. And and you saw this in all aspects of their life. You saw this religiously. They, they, They had... Religiously, the the people of Israel had abandoned the worship of God. 
And that's not to say that they had forgotten to worship him entirely. What I mean is that they basically just worshipped him as kind of one God among many. They were willing to offer God some token appreciation, but their hearts, their hearts were not entirely devoted to God. You saw it politically. Politically, again, the people, they would walk around and they would have the name of God on their lips, but when push came to shove, they were relying on their political alliances. They were relying on their strategic connections to keep them in power. And morally, morally things were a disaster. There was pride, and there was arrogance, and there was greed, and there was a tremendous amount of sexual sin, a lot of it connected to the worship of other gods. It was a time where the people's hearts were far from God. But it was prosperous. And there was wealth. And they really, really felt like they were in power. And it's right in the middle of all of this that God raises up Hosea. Now, we don't know a lot about Hosea, actually. Other than his name, we know very, very little about him. But we do know this. That he was a faithful servant of the Lord. He was all in when it came to the glory of God. We know that he was willing to suffer so that God would receive glory. He was willing to be humiliated so that God would receive glory. He wanted to make sure that whatever he did was faithful and in line with the word of God. His words and his actions, they stood as a testimony to the people around him about his, just his incredible love for God. And Tim and Aaron and Morgan and Rose, in many ways this morning when you stand up, your pledge is, is a desire to be faithful servants of the Lord. You're standing up and you're saying, I want to be all in when it comes to the glory of God. And our prayer is that God would more and more create that type of a faithful character in you, that he would develop and grow that so that you're willing to suffer so that God would get the glory. That you're willing at times in your life to be humiliated yourself so that God would get the glory. That you would have an attitude that says, I want to be less so that he would be more. That your words and that your actions would just, would just be a testimony to the people around you. And that's not easy. I think we all understand that that's not easy but it certainly wasn't for Hosea either. Hosea was called to a very, very difficult task, and this morning I want to spend some time in chapter 1 looking at three things that God calls Hosea to do. The first thing is the shocking one, I think, and that is that God calls Hosea to love an unlovable person. The word of the Lord comes to him in verse 2. And he's told, go and marry a promiscuous woman. The word there actually, maybe you could better translate it as, go and marry a woman who is going to prove unfaithful to you. And she's not just going to be unfaithful in the sense of adultery. No, no, this woman is going to be a harlot. She's going to be a prostitute. She is going to sell herself. I want you to imagine for a second how humiliating this was for Hosea. I want you to imagine what it would have been like for him to have people talking and, and gossiping and, and pointing out his wife. You could, almost, you could almost imagine that there would be times where people would take him aside and they'd say, hey, Hosea, Hosea, we should talk. And they would say, Hosea, why in the world would you love a woman like that? And the door would be open for Hosea to turn things around and say, 
why would God love a people like you? You know, they may not have listened to his words very easily, but I think that would have grabbed their attention. The whole point of this marriage between Hosea and Gomer, the whole point of it is to provide a picture of God's relationship with his people. It's to provide a picture of the most intimate relationship of marriage because that's the way that God feels about us. God wants you to know that he, it, the love is the most, the most close, intimate kind of love you can imagine. Intimate, loves you, cares for you, is concerned about you, has provided for you, blessed you, given you a lot of good things, and yet God is saying to these people, but you've been unfaithful. You're a land of unfaithfulness. You serve other gods. When it comes to needing help, you look to your strategic alliances and your political connections. That's where your trust is. And God says, I I'm, I'm like that jealous husband. God says, you've made a, a public mockery of my love. God says, you've humiliated me. And you've disappointed me time and time again. I wonder if any of you have had times in your life where you feel unloved. I wonder if you've had times in your life where you've really, really disappointed someone. I know that I've had a time like that. Well, not just one time. I've had lots of times, but this one we're going to... When I was about 18... Living in BC, one of the things that my friends and I love to do is we love to go four by fouring. I had some friends with big pickup trucks, and and we loved to go up logging roads. And we would find these remote trails, and we would go up, and we'd have bonfires and find mud puddles. I grew up with rednecks. That is my confession. And you know, my parents were always worried about this. My parents would always say to me. You guys, you got to be careful. You got to be careful. Guys, think about it. Be careful. And I would always be like, yeah, yeah, you know. I was 18. Well, one day, one day we went down to the river with a group of friends. There was five cars full of people. We were all going down to go four by fouring, and we were driving through the countryside at breakneck speeds, each of us trying to be braver and dumber than the other. And apparently, I was the dumbest of all. At some point, I decided to pull out and try to pass several cars, and I just, just T-boned a big F-250. Needless to say, it did not go well. It was Geo Metro versus F-250. And I was left with a, a, a nice souvenir to, to remember it by. And I was taken uh, by ambulance to the hospital. There was blood everywhere. I was a big mess. But I remember thinking the entire time, I had one real thought in my mind, and that thought was, how in the world am I going to explain this to my dad? And some of you are laughing because you know exactly what this feels like. Well, my dad showed up at the hospital, and he was upset. He was upset, and it was, a, uh, it was kind of a weird mixture of, of care and concern and, and anger and frustration, and also just a lot of disappointment. A huge amount of disappointment. Well, a few hours later, after the doctors had kind of put Humpty Dumpty to, together again, um, I had a friend of mine drive me home. And I remember coming into the house, and, and I just, I was so ashamed, I was so embarrassed, that I decided to kind of just slink right down to my room and to crawl into bed. And a bit later, the door opened and my dad came in. But instead of, instead of yelling at me and telling me what a fool I'd been, he just sat down on the bed and he said, I love you, son. He said, I love you. My dad has been gone 10 years. 
And there are a lot of things that I forget. But I always remember that. That feeling of knowing what it's like to be loved unconditionally. That feeling of, of knowing what it's like to be loved regardless of your performance. That sense of what it's like to be valued even with all of your flaws and faults. And trust me, I have quite a few. Well, that's the way that God looks at us. And that's the way that God values us. And that's the, that is the kind of grace that God wants to pour out on us. That's God's love, and it is different than any other, any other kind of love that you're going to find out there. I want to share with you a quote this morning that highlights an important distinction. Religion says, if we change, God will love us. But the gospel says, God's love changes us. See, in this book, Hosea doesn't change Gomer. He doesn't go to her and say, hey, hey, Gomer, if you change, if you finally change, then I will love you. Hosea says, I am going to love you in such a way that you can't help but change. He says, I am going to pour out my love on you in a way that changes you. That's God's love. And Hosea is willing to be publicly humiliated to show that kind of love. Just like Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ did not come, as we sometimes think, Jesus Christ did not come to tell us that, hey, when you get everything together, when your life is on track, then I'll love you. And said, Romans 5, verse 8, God demonstrated his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So many people miss the joy of the gospel because they spend so much time trying to clean up their lives, trying to clear up their mess, trying to be good enough that God will love them. That, friends, will never happen. God will love you as you are, but he wants your hearts. He wants your hearts. The sad part of the story of Israel is that they, they continually rejected God's love. They didn't, they didn't give him their they continued to reject God's love, and so God called Hosea to a second task. And, and, and that second task was to warn the wayward. God says, Hosea, I want you to warn them. Now, if Hosea's marriage was to be a real live testimony of the relationship between God and his people, then his kids were to be a real live testimony of his warnings for people. Hosea, in verse 3 through 9, we're, we're told they have three kids. And each of them is given a name that warns of judgment. Now, I know some of you think you've had a pretty hard time growing up. But I wonder what life was like for these kids. I know something of what it's like to grow up with a weird name. But you ever think about these kids? I mean, they're walking around. They're walking around. And their names, their lives, they're like walking billboards projecting God's punishment. We're told that there are, are three kids. Verse 4 tells us that they first have a, have a son and they call him Jezreel. Now, Jezreel is, is a name that in Hebrew, what it means is, is to sow. And it, it not really like to sow the way that we would understand it, but the way you sow seed, you kind of you scatter it out. 
And so his name, Jezreel, was kind of a warning of the punishment that was coming at the hands of the nation Assyria. The people of Israel didn't buy it at the time, but the truth was that Assyria was coming. And they would capture the people, and they would take them into exile, and they would be scattered among the nations. Now again, this, this is a prophecy that the people would have laughed at. They would have said, we're, we're so big and we're so strong, we're so well connected, we have so much going right, this can't happen. And so God says to them in verse 5, God says, in that day I will break Israel's bow. It's, it's a term that basically means I will, I will, I will crack your back, I, I will crush your strength, I will leave you defenseless. So that's Jezreel. Second child that we're introduced to is Lo Ruhama. It's a name for a girl that means not loved. Could also mean something like uh, no pity, uh, no mercy. It's like no compassion. What you have to understand is the intensity of the warnings are ramping up. And God is saying, I am going to withdraw my love from you. I'm going to pull back my favor from you. If you don't change, you will not experience my love. You will be not loved. Now, the interesting thing is that um, Judah, in verse 7, we're told, is spared this type of punishment. So Israel's on track for justice, but Judah will be spared. Just a quick comment about that. The, The reason for that is because under the reign of Hezekiah, the fourth king that's listed, Judah does turn back to the Lord. Not with their whole heart, but they, but they turn and they seek the Lord. This is exactly the time that Assyria is coming down and they're conquering Israel. They capture Samaria. They take the people captive. But this is also the time where Judah turns and um, God saves them with a miraculous victory, which I'd like to talk about today, but I don't have the time. So, for next time. But that's Lo Ruhama. The last child that's named is Lo Ami. And this child's name simply means not my people. For you are not my people, and I am not your God. This is a heavy, heavy warning. God says, God says, I've had enough. God says, I'm about to turn my face from you. God says, I'm about to to turn my back on you. The people continue to reject God, and God is being patient and patient and patient. I know that we see these names just listed off very quickly, like one, two, three, but the reality is that these children would probably have been born over a period of five, maybe ten years. So God is giving them opportunity and opportunity and opportunity to turn back, but they don't. Why is that? Because life is too good. I wonder if we hear that warning today. I wonder if we ever think about the fact that maybe life is just too good. I mean, we live in a time of immense prosperity. We're living in a country with a lot of security and a lot of wealth, and we have a tremendous amount of great things going on here, even in this church. We're blessed in so many ways. And not not just materially. We're blessed in a lot of other ways. When I look around this church, I see a lot of people. I don't know all of you, but I see a lot of people who've grown up in a Christian home. I see a lot of people who have heard the gospel of Jesus Christ since you were so tall. You've heard it talked about and you've heard it read and you've you've seen it lived out. Do we ever stop and think about what an amazing privilege that is? Do we ever think about the amazing grace of God God in allowing us to have that? Do we ever think about the fact that there are people all over the world 
that would trade places in an instant to have had that kind of childhood. To have had that kind of experience. And yet the truth is, let's be honest, the truth is that so often we take it for granted. We take it for granted. Why? Because life's too good. Life's so good, we grow up, we are in the era of planes, trains, and automobiles. We go where we want, when we want. We have computers and TVs and iPads and iPods and iPhones 7, 8, 9, 10. We have music and we have movies and we have TVs. We live in the land where there's half a million dollar homes. Have you ever? That's ridiculous. Sorry, a little tangent. I mean, we we have so much prosperity. Things are so good. But where are our hearts? Have things become so good that our hearts start to wander? Can I just ask you this morning, simple question. Is God your everything? Or is he just one of many things? No, God's love changes us. And I think a great way for us to reflect on whether we've truly been changed by God's love is to think about whether we have that same love for others. I really have trouble believing that someone has been changed by God's love when they do not have love for others. It is just not in line with the way that God's love changes people because you've missed something. We're all unlovable. We're all unlovable. And yet when you understand that your filthy spirit of prostitution type of heart, when you understand that in spite of all that, God just washes over you with his love, then that's the kind of thing that you share with others because it tells you there's hope. It tells you there's hope. I'm going to close just with a comment on Hosea's last task, and that's this. He's called to share that message of hope. We would look at this text and we would say, well, I think it's done. They've been so unfaithful. They've been so hard-hearted that they, they have rejected God's covenant time and time again. They've rejected that relationship we would say, God, it's okay, just abandon them because that's what we would do. But God's faithfulness stretches way beyond what we can imagine. God says, I'm not abandoning this covenant. I'm not abandoning this relationship. God says, no, Abraham's descendants, that's the language of verse 10. Abraham's descendants will be like the sand on the seashore. And God says, this is how I will do it. God says, I'm going to establish a new covenant, better, bigger than the one before. And in Romans 9, you can look at it later today. Romans 9, Paul quotes the exact verses from Hosea to say that God's love is going to go out now. It's not just Jew, it will include Gentiles. God has a, has a, a love that's going to pour out upon all tribes and upon all nations. And most importantly, God is going to give them a new leader. Jesus Christ. But that leader is going to be asked to marry an unfaithful bride. But Christ will love that unfaithful bride with such a perfect love. Christ will love that bride with the love of God in such a way that it heals broken hearts. And God will will remove 
from that unfaithful bride a spirit of prostitution and he will place in it a spirit of faithfulness. And that leader will love the lame and the leper and the blind and the prostitute. And that leader will go to any length to show that love. He will be humiliated and scoffed at and suffer and be rejected and hang on a cross. But he will love that bride. God withdraws his love from Jesus Christ. God turns his love from Jesus Christ so that an unfaithful bride would be forgiven. And God turns his face away from his own son. God turns his back on his son, Jesus Christ, so that we would have new names, so that we would be called children of the living God. Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ will love you with all of your faults. If you don't know the love of Jesus Christ this morning, and if you've come here thinking that this is just about getting better and doing more and living more righteously, then you've missed the heart of the gospel. Jesus Christ says, I will love you as you are. He just wants you to give him your hearts, to look to him and to be all in for his glory. Let's pray. Lord God, we realize this morning as we reflect on your word, we realize that you have a love that is beyond anything that we can imagine. You have a grace and a compassion for sinners that we don't have for sinners. You demonstrate love for us in a way that we so often don't demonstrate to others. And Father, we pray that you would convict us. Would you convict us that you love us? Would you convict us of your grace and of your kindness? Would you have that just pour over people today? There is something so incredibly liberating. There is such freedom in letting go of our sin, letting go of our burdens, leaving those things behind, and knowing what it lo means to, to just be loved with all of our faults and with all of our flaws. And when we experience that love, we can't help but just pour out that love on other people. We want others to know what it's like to have hope. We want others to know what it's like to, to get off of, of the rat race of just trying to be better and to know that you are loved in Jesus Christ. We want others to embrace that gift and to know the peace that surpasses understanding. Father, would you bring that peace today upon the lives of many in this place and wherever your word is preached today. Amen.